I guess I wanted to be an artist, and then I suppose I'm a, maybe a photo-based artist, but I could also just as easily call myself a photographer. So uh, 48 views is going to go on this wall. That wall is going to be blank because this is such a heavy wall with stuff. We want to need a, we need a little bit of uh, um, relief. And then right here, this wall is going to have uh, the complete prestige 12-inch jazz cap up. They're all numbers on that wall. Then in here, uh, we're gonna have some vitrines. Vitrines? And we're gonna have um, hotel maquettes. I think about 196 little photographs of hotel signs on one of these walls. And, and five large ones, six foot hotel signs. Well, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to finish. Well, as a child, I drew, and uh, after I got out of the Air Force, I guess 1944-45, I didn't wasn't sure what I'd do. I guess I was about 19. I thought the only thing I can do reasonably well is draw, and I think perhaps it's a chance to be a commercial artist. So I went into a, an engraving house in Montreal, which is where I lived, and I got a job for $12.50 a week. They had an art department, and they made engravings for magazines and newspapers. I was cutting mats for, for other artists, and I used to have to run out for sandwiches and stuff to sort of augment my income. I totally enjoyed being an artist, and as soon as I got into it, I decided I wanted to be a designer, which I was. And in 1952, I moved to New York City and freelanced there for a couple of years. Did a lot of album covers for Columbia, and things like that. I was, I was looking for kind of more prestige pieces to do. When I was a graphic designer, I was totally into it. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I, I wanted to be the best graphic designer on the block, as it were. Yeah, around, um, I guess, 1953, I was uh, doing a few album covers for Columbia Records. And uh, I went around to Prestige Records, and I saw Ira Gittler there. And he said, go and see this Mr. Mingus. At the time, the name didn't mean anything to me. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of Charles Mingus. Anyway, I went around to see him, and he explained that he had just done this concert in Massey Hall in Toronto, 
and um, he needed a cover. So he got on the phone, he phoned Max Roach. Max Roach came over in about 10 minutes and they agreed to let me do the cover. And they decided to go with a 10 inch cover on this. And I designed the thing on the way back to my studio in the, in the subway, just sitting in the subway car, it sort of roughed it out. It became a very famous recording. That's it. Who knows? <laughs> I might get a picture. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Up until the age of 39, I was a graphic designer, and I made this sudden change and I, I decided to work with the camera. And it, it was hard work, but in a way, everything that I had learned as a graphic designer, like um, everything that I had put into my graphic design, I was able to transfer it fairly easily into photography, like the sense of surprise and composition and texture and all those things. So it wasn't too difficult, it was exciting. That went on for about seven years, and, and during that time I had uh, did a lot of fashion work and a lot of um, portraiture for, for magazines, and uh, I'd also been doing some pictures for myself. And at the end of the seven years, I looked very closely at all the work and I thought this, it, it's fine, but there's nothing here that, that is uh, terribly unique about it. And, but I, I thought somewhere inside me, I have, I have something that I can do and I don't know what it is. And I just decided overnight really that I'd try being an artist. So I sold all my camera equipment. I think I kept my Nikon, but I sold all my Hasselblad stuff. I sold my house sort of as, as startup money, and I um, began drawing from the model. And also I was keeping notebooks, and I was doing lists of things that have in influenced me. I was sort of teaching myself in a way to be an artist. Anyway, one day I was drawing the model's head. It was a profile. And I realized if I, if I drew a, a, a perfect circle, uh, that her, her forehead would touch the edge of the circle, her nose would just touch it, her chin would touch it, and somehow the, the, the back of her head would form the circle. And I, I became very aware of uh, proportion in the human head. I thought, I've got to try to show what I'm seeing and make people just aware of all these differences in, in people's heads and their, the way they look without making it particularly like portraits, per se. So uh, from there on, I, I, uh, I stopped drawing class. Um, I didn't have a camera, so I had to buy a used, uh, I bought a used Roly to begin with, and I started making experiments. And from there, I went on to, uh, doing the 64 portrait studies, which wherein I, I tried to show that sort of comparison.
Now I was I was talking earlier about when I was a graphic designer and I became a photographer, and that that switch wasn't wasn't all that much of a transition, but going into being a uh, an, a visual artist, it was a, a totally different mindset in a way. It was a very different thing. And I have found that when you do a, a picture or a piece, that people will see it in a different way. And also, it will turn out perhaps the way you didn't see it. Photography has a habit of, of not behaving. And, it, and, and, it's, and it's also, photography is also a record of the relationship that exists that moment between the photographer and the, the subject. I had just completed 64 portrait studies in Toronto and the following year I, I went to Paris and I thought I'm going to do another large work like 64 portrait studies and I'll, I'll, and this time I'm going to use French chefs, they'll all be from one restaurant. And I thought well I'll, I'll have a, a chance to maybe shoot two or three rolls on each chef and then go back to Toronto, edit it and make a piece. So. This is about 11.30 in the morning, and this restaurant, the restaurant Le Doyenne, is right in the middle of the Champs-Élysées. It's surrounded by trees and things. So I set up outside the restaurant, so I was getting open sky. Anyway, I, I'm about to shoot the first chef, and I'm, I'm looking through the viewfinder at him, and I turn my head, and there's 19 other chefs in a queue waiting for their picture to be taken. So I, I thought immediately, I, I don't have the luxury of doing it the way I want to do it. And it just quick as a, a flash, I, I thought, well, there's 12 pictures on a roll of film. I want to do front views and side views. I'll do three front views and three side views of each chef, which will be two chefs for roll of film. And I just ran it off, bang. And I just sent it off to the lab and didn't think about it. And it came back all cut neatly in threes, which is the way they cut thing. And I, I realized the whole, the whole piece was a, a sequential work, and I couldn't show anything other than all the pictures. I, just, I tried working with it, and they just said, show me. I did in uh, 1981, which we've never printed. We're printing it now. Um, Catherine Carmichael. They're part of the 48 views series, where I take exactly 48 pictures of a person. And they go, they start like this one, two, three, four. And they're photographed in sequence like that. So that each time they're facing the camera and they're turning back for the profile.
the reason I took 48, it's, it's four rolls of film. It fits on one sheet of paper, so it's a contact. There's uh, close to 8,000 photographs on this wall. This was done, as I say, in the early 80s. It didn't seem as if anybody was photographing these artists, so I'm happy to have these, these pictures now. There's um, Northrop Fry there, John Max, the Montreal photographer, um, Jackie Burroughs, Ron Tom, the architect who is now dead, Earl Burney, the poet, John Weinzweig, the composer, there's Yusuf Karsh, the photographer over there. How did you talk all these famous people into coming and posing for you? It's a funny thing about famous people. But they invariably say yes. I was doing the odd editorial photo portrait, and someone phoned me and said, will you go up and photograph Karsh? And I mean, it wasn't my cup of tea, and I said, yes, I will, because I wanted to meet him. And I went up and did the picture. I was very nervous, actually. And he, he put me at my ease, like as if I was the subject, in a way. <laughs> Not, and uh, he's, I came in with all my flash stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, well, I'd like to, to come back and photograph you on my own terms, and do a picture, which he agreed to do. And I think it took about two years before he, we actually set a date. He insisted on wearing his hat, which is a good thing, because the hat looks good. And uh, I proceeded to photograph. I didn't tell him I was going to take 48 pictures of him. Maybe I told him a minute before. But, but uh, you can see that you can see his surprise, being taken by surprise, that he's suddenly part of something that's going on, like it's, it's like, stop the world, I want to get off. And then you can see him, if you follow the, the pictures, see him sort of pulling himself together and then trying to inject stuff into the picture himself. So what we do uh, when we have these up on the wall is we, we step back, Gail and myself, and we look at the pictures and uh, decide if any are not quite working, maybe a little too dark or something like that. A little dark, the skin tones compared to the others. I don't know if you can catch that. I think I was aware of what photography does, and, and that photography cap captures a moment in, in someone's life. And I saw nobody was doing that. During that period, I photographed a lot of the Toronto art community, because so I, I didn't see anyone doing, making a record of it. In fact, I think about 15 or 20 percent of those people are dead which is un unbelievable, because they were young people. In the case of the portraits, there's an impersonal edge to it because I, I've arranged it in grids very coldly, I suppose. And it's as if there is no photographer involved. It's, it's like a machine could have done it. I, I think, uh, above all, there has to be some idea behind the work. It is relatively easy for me to do work that uh, would look great, 
probably wouldn't have any ideas. Because I, I have a design background and I can do something that look quite flashy. And a lot of, you see a lot of flashy stuff that doesn't have too much of an idea. How I came to photograph Joseph Boys. In 1979, I was in New York. At that time, there was a, a large retrospective of the work of Joseph Boys at the Guggenheim. I had seen very little of his work, and I was mightily impressed by this show, and I thought, I have to photograph this man. So the following year, I, I flew to Paris, and I took the train up to Dusseldorf, I was going to write to him, and I thought, no, I'm not, he's going to say no. And so I, I said, well, I'll, I'll go and go up there. So I went up to Dusseldorf, and I thought, I, when I get to Dusseldorf, I phone him. I got there, and I said, no. And I got on the streetcar, and I went to his house and rang his doorbell. And he answered the door himself, wearing his hat, as usual. And... Uh, I explained that I was from Toronto and that I wanted to take his picture. And he said, well, he was too busy. And I said, well, I said, well, that's, I guess that's the way it is because I've got all the time in the world. And he stopped and he looked at me and he thought, well, why don't you come by next Wednesday at 10 o'clock? So Joseph Boys elected to try to make every picture look exactly the same. Uh, which he almost did, but not quite successfully. But it, though, makes the piece very successful in that when you walk into a room and you see the piece, you think it's the same photograph. I'll hold it up against the rest of the piece. What, what do you think? Like, let's see the old one. Oh, yeah, it's too light, isn't it? Yeah. Should we take that right out? I'll believe it for now. I'll okay. the rest. So this is okay? Good. No, hold on. Oh, all right. I want to see it more. Not bad. Okay. So uh, it's a keeper? For the moment. So this was given a half a second more yeah. print exposure, and we burned the shoulder about th uh, three more seconds. Yeah. Now, Mike, um, these, these three here, I think... You know, you lost the sun when you were shooting. Okay, so from 76 to 83, mm -hmm. tell me if, if they're okay. I'm just having a quick look from back here. Well, 85 needs some work. What's happening there? Well, it's too light through here. All right. The shoulder's too light and the jacket's too light. The face is okay. The rest of it's fine. Yeah, it's just that part needs a little bit. Okay, F8. We'll give it the usual three minutes to the developer. If it was just one print, that, you know, that technique could be used, but we're working on a hundred prints. Yeah. And, uh, no, I mean, generally speaking, you do that. It's a lot darker, just even out of the, out of the water. Mm -hmm. Will this come up a bit more? Um, it'll different? dry down, yeah. It'll get a slightly darker as it dries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe three minutes might be a touch long uh, with the two and a half filter. I think filter. you're going to have a problem here. Yeah. And I don't know about here. It may be fine, but... So I think we should probably 
before we print 12 of them. Let's try the, these next, these last two frames over again. Okay. Okay. People will uh, walk into the room and see this piece, and they'll, they'll, some people, a lot of people, they'll think, oh, it's a repeat, and they'll walk out of the room. But in actuality, each photograph is a different photograph, different negative, different moment in time. And um, Joseph Boyes tried very hard to have each image look the same. Now, of course, that's impossible. There's a, a blink here and there. Uh, in some images, his head, near the end, his head begins to droop, as you can see. So Arno, do you know how many images there are all together in this entire show? Well, there's close to 8,048 views. There's 2,500 here, that's 10, probably about 11,000 images altogether. I guess when I decided to be a fine artist, I had no idea that I'd be a photographer. And I thought I was going to be a painter. And I, I just sort of came to a realization that all I had to do was to show the head with no, no adornment at all. And photography was the best way to do that. Um, that went on from about 1974 to 1983, which was eight or nine, eight or nine years of portraits there. I think uh, I wanted to change a little bit and, and investigate other things. So I got into cataloging systems and working with typography and numbering systems and things like that. That was a, in a way, looking at it now, it was a transition period. They led it into the hotel photographs that I did in 1991. home a bit of Paris. I wanted to do a piece that was very, something to do with Paris. And I didn't know what it was, and I just walked. And I had a few ideas. They were kind of lukewarm. And uh, then one day it dawned on me, I see these every day. They're something you see and that you don't see. And uh, while I was Doing these pictures and, and seeing these views in Paris, I was thinking of Eugène Aget, the French photographer who photographed much of Paris in the late part of the 19th century, right up to 1927 when he died. So he, he was in my mind when I was doing these pictures. That it was like somewhere he was inside me. I, I felt a, a great connection with him. of about three months. I photographed, oh, I think about um, three, 300 of them. I walked probably most of the streets of Paris. Everyone is different though. Mm -hmm.
funny thing too, seeing something vertical. It's we just we don't read it. We just know it says hotel. Nice one. See the long skinny one there. What is it about that sign? This this is a this is a very In the case of the hotel photographs, I'm showing that these things are similar, um, and I'm saying have a, have a good look, because maybe you thought they were all the same, and they're not. Everyone's totally different in small ways. I, when I show the hotel pictures, normally if I'm doing it myself, I will show a group of hotel signs that are extremely similar, like they'll all be sans serif white on black, for instance. So that at first glance you almost think they are all the same sign. And then within that very restricted format you'll see the differences. That appeals to me. adjusting the focus over there. It's a very fine adjustment. And when, when it's actually in focus, the, the grain of the film is in focus. It's a six, a six foot print, and it's, uh, so the only way we can develop it is to roll it. I prefer black and white. I think photography is black and white. But um, in 1994, I think it was, I came across this packet of, all these packets of little tags that related to child labor. And I tried photographing in black and white, and they just didn't sing. They just looked awful. Then I, I did color Xerox to them. I thought maybe I can get away with color Xerox, and they still looked awful. So then I photographed them in 35 millimeter and blew them up, and they still looked awful. This is in color. And so I ended up having to go to two and a quarter square before they would say, OK, you're on. I found them in Montpellier at a big outdoor flea market. And they were in a box, just covered in dust and dirt. And I did, had no idea what they were. Uh, but something about them interested me. So I bought them, took them home. And along with them were little booklets or livres. And it said, Travail des enfants dans l'industry. And it was referring to child labor. I think uh, that these tags came out of a textile factory in the southwest of France near Lyon. And uh, uh, so these, ch these children were working in this textile factory. Uh, it's 
the only, only trace we have of them. And it's uh, rather poignant because we, uh, we can imagine, we have to imagine the rest. These are the um, little livrets. Here's um, Eugène Louise Janoli and Marie Antoinette Moulin. And they're all from the same village. Uh, I'm not, I can't pronounce it properly. It's Ambereu uh, en Bougie. And it's very close to Lyon, where, where uh, a lot of the textiles are made, the, the, the silks, beautiful silks are made there. And they came in little bundles like this, actually, when I, in this box. They're just filthy, dirty. I had no idea what they were. I do shoot my own stuff, but for this stuff, this particular stuff is 4x5, and I don't shoot 4x5. So I have someone do it that can do it better than me. I don't even have a 4x5 camera, so. Well, I bought that Hasselblad and Henry's for 1000 bucks for the lens. We use it for everything. I have the Nikon. Well, I'm a tripod freak. I have a, a heavy, heavy, heavy tripod. Uh, get so very heavy, like for a view camera, you know, huge, huge, heavy thing. And I have a, a arm extends out like this, and then I put sandbags on the back. Because I, I do a lot of this kind of shooting with the Hasselblad, like the tags, the envelopes. So it's almost like a copy camera setup, you know. This new show I've been doing, showing sort of the other half of the coin and people that lived quite well. Sort of a little portrait of them without seeing them. These are all um, invoices for a couple that lived in Lyon around 1865. A count and a countess de Lupe, and what they spent their money on. These are all invoices for chocolate and flour and things like that. And wine, too. There's an invoice I have here for a barrel of 1929 Chateauneuf de Pape. It should be worth quite a bit now, I think. You can be working with a lot of ideas and then something will come along, something you see usually, or a thought. It's usually, for, in my case, something I see and it just it blows everything out of the water. It's so much better than those other ideas that I had in my mind or that I even pursued to some extent. Uh, everything adds up somehow with that particular thing. Like, when I discovered the envelopes with the black X's, it just blew everything out of the water. I'm always looking for ideas and things that will trigger something. I look at a lot of paper, and uh, one day I was looking through some old letters in a, in a paper show, I think it was, and I came across these envelopes with the X on the back. I had maybe seen one before, one or two, but there were half a dozen together, and I realized that every one was a little bit different. So 
for me, there was no monotony in seeing them in this way and just triggered that just a couple of seconds. I thought, that's what I have to do. I have to find a lot and show them. Have the blade in. It's still oh, in it. Oh, oh, oh. A few. The fronts are more uh, graphic. I look for death notices, the envelopes that have the black edge. Mm -hmm. And some of them have on the back, uh, the, the way the envelope's folded, it forms a black X. And a person would receive this in the mail, and it's more than likely a notification of, of death. The five red marks are, are seals. And it, on the front, it says chargé. Mm -hmm. And that, that was our um, form of, of registering a letter at the time. And they would put f five wax seals on it. But somehow with this design, with the, f the five red seals on it, it becomes like a, a bright flag or something. It's, it's like quite beautiful. I'm trying to get a lot done right now. I guess, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's sort of a race against time. Now, I enjoy every day. I, I don't want to waste my time, no. This is a, this is a lovely piece. I have a love for type. I was a lettering artist. <laughs> I started off as a lettering artist, and uh, look, at, look at the way that, that type hits that curve. It's so beautiful. I just love it. I like things enclosed in glass like this, too. Vitrines and things like that. They're uh, wonderful. When I was um, a youngster, I was about four years old, and I lived in the country, and um, there was a, a guy who came along every week on a motorcycle, but in a sidecar, and everything was painted white. And the sidecar was actually a, a box with a glass top, and inside were rows of popcorn, just in white packages. But on the side of the motorcycle, or the sidecar, it said, stop me and buy one. And I'd put my hand up, and he would stop, and I'd give him five cents, and I'd take this bag of popcorn in the house. And I was so fascinated by it, that very often it would sit on the shelf, and I wouldn't eat it, and it would, sort of go soggy. My mother, mother would have to throw it away finally. But seeing these rows of paper bags inside this box, looking at it through glass, I think affected my work in a way. Well, I started collecting jugs because I like them and they're relatively inexpensive. They look similar. And then when you start to look at them, they, you see the differences, and there's differences in the shine on some of them. Some of them, the, the white has gone a little yellowy, sometimes it's bluish, sometimes there's little drips in the enamel a little bit, so they have a personality. <coughs> Yeah, that was, that was a good price, too. They're beautiful. They're the hard one, the hard ones to find the little ones like that. It's like a, just like a, a, a copy of a big one, you know? I love it. I photographed a few. I wasn't happy with the results. I'm happy to, happier to, to enjoy looking at them. I love them. No, they're just for my own amusement. I do many projects where I photograph and photograph, and I have a thing that I think it's going to look wonderful, and it doesn't. 
and I don't use it. Sometimes it costs me a lot of money too, the stuff that I don't use. I had a show in, in Paris, I guess, not last winter, the winter before last, and I met a, a curator there, Eileen Summerman, and she had a, a beautiful little space that she was doing some shows in. It's a, it was a, a storefront on a side street, a little pedestrian street. And uh, I thought that's, I would like to show the jugs in the window, which I did. And on one, on one side, I had these very straight, they call them body jugs in one window, and the others I had all curvy ones. So it was sort of like male and female. But I love the fact that people would walk by and they wouldn't know what it, quite what it was, and yet it, was, it beckoned to them in a way. It, were they for sale or what was it, you know? And I like that. Normally when I, when I do something and I get interested, then I do a lot of it. I just do that non-stop for a long time. And right now it's not the main interest in my life right now. I guess I'm trying to clear up a, a certain part of, like in the late 70s, early 80s, I did a lot of portraiture, a lot of portraiture. I'm trying to clean that up and make prints for the portraits I did. And then sort of organizing my life a bit. I, I did a lot of very good portraits and a lot of them haven't been seen. And I want, I want closure on that. Closure is the word. I'll be happier, feel freer when that segment of my photography is complete. And I can go on. I suppose maybe I should be just going crazy doing new stuff all the time, but I don't believe that right now. I believe it's more important to finish part of this body of work, which is good and is unfinished. When did you um, take the photograph? I took it in 19... 77. And is this the first time you've printed it? First time printed like this, yeah. I've, I've never uh, shown it in a gallery or anything. It's never been shown. And why did you wait so long to print it? Uh, the things got in the way. It's too busy. <laughs> <laughs>